All right, so I want to do some physics today. Where's Michael? Well, this is no good. Class is No, class is not canceled. All right, so I want to talk about two things today. I want to talk about the center of mass. I want to talk about the moment of inertia. I love it. In the book, you'll find some discussion of gravitation, which I might talk about a bit on Monday if we have time. Um, and there are li literally oodles of applications of multiple integrals to questions that arise in physics, of which I'm just doing a, a small sample here, because we don't have time to do everything. What? Obviously, there are generalizations of these notions in statistics. So you can all ask Abe how that goes when he learns it. Yeah, a bow? A bow show? Does that work? Also. Also show up. A bow. Llama, do you need new glasses? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So first thing I want to start talking about, and I've used this example before is if you have a something that's physical as opposed to mathematical, you might want to discuss how heavy it is. So there's a notion of density, and you can refer to it in any number of dimensions you want to. So if you have a region in R and, in fact, you can think about n equals 2 and n equals 3, but you can actually think of it in Rn that you have some region, say in the plane like this, or say a, a glob in three space or in more dimensions. What's the natural notion of what density should mean? Mass, mass per unit of whatever dimensional volume you're in. So if you're at a point, you can think about taking little squares, say, around the point. If you're in three dimensions, you can think about taking little cubes around the point, or little balls. And you could imagine taking the, the mass of, the, of, the, of this little epsilon sized creature that contains the point x and dividing by whatever dimensional volume you're doing. So this would be area in two dimensions. Now that's not correct yet. Right? If, you, if you actually take the mass of this chunk divided by its area, that's the average density of that chunk. So how am I going to get the actual density? Let epsilon go to zero. So the notion of density is actually like a derivative. And in fact, when you study a subject called measure theory, if you go on in mathematics, this is actually becomes what's called a radonicotine derivative of a measure. Mm -hmm. Is it similar to, I guess, number one on the web work? No. No, no, no. What was going on in, in number one on the web work is it was an improper integral because the function's blowing up as you go to zero. And we've only defined integrals of bounded functions, so that's why that epsilon. But so you want to think about basically taking uh, this limit idea, and then you can actually prove, and this is actually discussed in the book, that the mass you get back by integrating the density function. It makes sense, right? It sort of has the fundamental theorem of calculus feel to it, that if I'm saying you should think of density in some sense as a derivative, then you undo the derivative by integrating over the region and you get the total mass. So this, is, this, this really is an analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Instead of being a rate of change, it's very different. Well, it's a rate of change with respect to area. If you were on a linear thing, if you were on a straight line segment, density would be a function of x, and you would literally be talking about the root of respect to x. 
the mass area? Right. I would think we have yeah, like mass as a function of mass is a function of region. So mass is this generalized notion that assigns to each region a number and it behaves in some natural way. Then it's going to be like the derivative of that. Yes, that's exactly right. So go take measure theory and you'll find out all about this, although they won't necessarily talk about the physics when they're doing it. Okay, so we have a notion of density and basically if you want to think about physical notions, you want to think about approximating regions that happen to be smushy regions. You want to say, okay, I'm going to approximate them by chopping them up into a finite number of pieces and pretending I had a finite number of masses. I'm going to work with the physics of that finite number of masses. So, for example, suppose I had masses sitting at various positions. So this would be mass 1 sitting at position x1, mass 2 sitting at position x2, etc. Mass 3 sitting at position x3, and so mass k sitting at position xk. And so the physicists or the statisticians might want to know where is the weighted average of the masses. That's called the center of mass. So the center of mass of this configuration, so I have a configuration here of a finite number of masses. So that we'll usually write as x bar, but it depends not just on where the, not just where the points are, but what the masses are, right? If these masses are all equal, then you're asking what's the average position there. But otherwise you're weighting them according to the masses. Right? This one might be a lot heavier than this one, that it's going to tug more in that direction than this one's going to tug in this direction. And so what you do, you take the sum of the position vectors weighted by each mass divided by the total mass. And that's if you think about that, if you, this is like taking the sum of the proportion of each mass is to the total mass times the position vectors. So this is the sense in which it's a weighted average. From one to k? Yeah, one to k. So why am I saying there's an analog in statistics? Weighted average, right? Or even in computing what your grade in this course is, you don't just <laughs> average all the data, you do a weighted average of all the data. Because certain things weigh more than certain other things. But you take the weights all add up to one, right? That's what the crucial thing here is. Alright, so I could similarly then ask what is the analog for a continuous mass distribution. So it's a, a not just a finite collection of masses, but a, a glob that has varying density. Is it so this is a region omega. This is a glob with variable density. Is it a function for density? We have a function for density. So if I'm talking about a mass distribution, I'm going to give you a density function say, here's what the density is as a function of x. And you might even think about it as having density, whatever it is here, and then zero everywhere outside the region if you wanted to think about it that way. But what we're going to do, and I'm not going to belabor this in any particularly <coughs> rigorous way, but what you imagine doing is chopping the region up into little pieces. So if it were a rectangle, you could partition it. So partition this thing into little into rectangles, whatever. All right, just, just partition it up into rectangular pieces. 
and we're going to approximate the mass distribution here by putting a single mass in the center of each of these pieces. <coughs> and so we'll have some large number of chunks. But we'll have a finite number of chunks, each of which has some mass to it. So approximate the mass distribution. Mass distribution. Mass <laughs> distribution. <laughs> by a discrete configuration of masses. So that's what we're talking about here. So you can think about an origin somewhere, and you can take a position vector for each of these chunks, and you could add up exactly as we did here and get that the weighted average of the position vector would be exactly the same thing these mass samples are we just choosing points randomly in, in each square? Well, I was actually saying take the take the center so of each little piece. Really <coughs> so we're doing Riemann sums here, kind of, because of things you can't integrate. Well, I'm not doing, them. yeah, I mean, so... If we can't integrate that, it, the lower sums would all be zero. Well, we, I'm doing vectors, so upper and lower sums don't even make sense, so I'm doing vector functions here. But it wouldn't really matter what point you chose inside each In box. the limit as as you squeeze everything down, that's right. So what this is going to do is you're going to say, look, I'm taking, what, what is the amount of mass in the little chunk? Well, it's approximately the density at the ith chunk times the volume of the ith chunk. Right, mass is density times volume if you have a little enough chunk, you can assume the density is constant. So I mean, I'm doing an approximation here, and as you guys are saying, it really is going to turn into a Riemann sum. Times x i, and then divide by the total mass. So you're like taking the limit for more and more. Right. So now I'm going to say, and I'm not going to do this rigorously, I'm going to say chop into smaller and smaller pieces. And you'll recall that that homework problem that you did, that you all loved so much, you proved that if you had an integrable function, there was a delta, so that if you made all the partition pieces have size less than delta, then your upper sum minus lower sum was automatically less than the epsilon. So Which really means was. that if I make the pieces small enough, and I have integrable functions, by doing this Riemann sum construction, I'm going to be <coughs> within epsilon of an actual integral. So that problem really was a big deal, wasn't it? It's, I said it was important for applications, and it is conceptually. So by home, earlier homework, for small enough pieces, we get better and better approximations to what integral? Well, we're getting the integral of the density function times the, times the position vector integrated over the volume. So we're adding up density times position vector and the and multiplying by the chunk of volume. So we're integrating a vector function here, which is weighting the position vector by the density at the point. So it's a weighted average in the sense of an integral. Remember, we talked about average value of a function by integrating the function and dividing by the volume. Well, now we're going to weight by the density. So we're going to divide by the total <coughs> mass. This is going to be the total mass. And that is going to be what is called the center of mass of the region. Right. So that, that's the formula. So center of mass of omega, where omega now is a 
region together with the distribution <coughs> is given by 1 over the mass times the, as I just said, the weighted average of the position vector, where the weight is according to the density function. And the total mass here is the integral of the density. Okay, so let's do an example. So that was just restating what we just said yeah. over there, right? I'm giving the official definition. Yep. So the physicists in the room, which isn't very many, why do people care about centers of mass from the physics standpoint? So you can treat things as points. Yeah, you can. It's not like even if you look like almost a point or something. It would well, I mean, the little bird toys where you put the beak on your finger, and the whole bird's this way, it just stays. But you want to treat things yeah, as points, so it's simpler to find out where its center of mass is and just say it's all right well, there. Does that know like how much it moves? Like if you hit the object with force, that center of mass is what moves. So if you if you have a force acting on the system of masses, the net behavior of the system is going to be as if you concentrated that force acting on a, a mass with the total mass at the center of mass. So from the viewpoint of F equals M A, that system will behave as if you concentrated it all at the center of mass and watch how it behaves. Isn't it like if you hang uh, That's what Patrick was just saying. Yeah. Right? So if you just thought of some mass distribution and, and said, where can I put a fulcrum so it will balance, if you put your finger on, at the center of mass, then exactly that region is going to balance on the tip of your finger. And that's because all the torques are balancing out to zero. I mean, like, where are you need center of mass? Or is it? Yes. It always is one specific point. Yes. But there are situations in physics where saying, oh, I'll just put everything at the center of mass is wrong. So I, this is giving away what I sometimes assign as a challenge problem. <laughs> but there, beware. If you put say a mass m here and a mass m here, and you think of that as a configuration of masses, and you ask, how does that configuration pull <coughs> on a test mass that's there? Is it the same as if you put the, the <coughs> two masses at their center of mass and then let that it pull on the test mass? Yeah. No. So it's not always kosher to say, I take my system of masses, I might as well assume it's a point mass concentrated at the center of mass. But the thing you're testing in is within that mass, right? No, it's not. That's why I said it was a test mass. But what so you write how does this, this is the system. The green guys are the system. Okay. How do they pull on this guy? Well, if you put them at the center of mass, you would have a mass 2m there, and it would be pulling x this way. But in fact, it gets pulled towards this mass because this guy's far away. It doesn't contribute. Uh, that's just like so you have to be careful about saying, oh, I can always just do the center of mass and see what happens. That's wrong. So the challenge problem, right? Not anymore. <laughs> for, for our definition, maybe this is a silly question, but what have, have we dealt with vectors inside of interval? I don't know, have we? Yeah. Yeah, probably. We actually did when I discussed arc length for you guys last semester. Well, of course you all remember that lecture. Well, I think so that was like the length of a vector, which is different. But I actually said, I actually used a version of the triangle inequality where I said integrating the length is less than or equal to taking, is greater than or equal to taking the magnitude of integrating the vector. So I actually did discuss it, but that, okay. let me just say, what does this mean? Recall, if f is a vector value function what it means to integrate f as a vector is you take the vector consisting of the integrals of the component functions okay.
Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, in fact, I'm about to do that. Okay. So now let's do an example. So let's say I have, um, say, omega is a half ball. So by that I mean take a solid ball and cut it in half. Wasn't that creative? So just take the upper hemi ball, for example, in R3. Now let's say its density is equal to, or is proportional to, ah, proportional to distance from the center of the ball. <coughs> Find the center of mass. This is a real pain, by the way. I've been writing X with a bar and an arrow. It really should be X with an arrow with a bar. Yeah. Bar means average, and you're doing the average of the vector. So, you, it's really that whole yeah. chart. <laughs> so we need to go back in, in our notes. That means everything. <laughs> you just need to turn the bottom one into an arrow and erase the arrow head on the top of it. Right, an equal chalk. So in the book, there's no confusion because it's a bold X with an arrow on it. With a bar on it. You see now there is confusion. All right. So here I have this half ball. And it's not uniform. It gets heavier as you get further away from the center of the original ball. <clears throat> Votes on where the center of mass should be. Well, definitely on the line is equal to zero. If, if not, that is the did, origin. Well, you misspoke, but you meant the right thing. Yeah. Um, no, it's the axis. It's the axis. So, is what it meant. Is everything around so Daniel yeah, claim, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so by symmetry claim, by symmetry, yeah. by symmetry, the center of mass is going to be somewhere <coughs> on the Z axis. So we can come to a single integral. So, well, not a single integral, but one integral. It's not. It's a multiple integral still. Why, why, why would it be a multiple integral? Because you're integrating over a region. I mean, the, the the, the, no, I, okay, hang on. So first of all, let, let, let's discuss this for a minute. So why is it obvious by symmetry that the x and y coordinates of the center of mass are zero? Is it any z cross section? Why? Because any point on one side has an equal point on the other side. It's not a well, not. Because say it's it more sure. precisely. It's, it's symmetric. symmetric. <coughs> the region is symmetric. And the density is symmetric. Yeah. The density is symmetric about the z-axis, right? The density function of the slice that Cameron was just talking about is not constant. But if I take a little chunk here. <coughs> And I, and I reflect it across the <coughs> axis and look at the corresponding chunk there, they have the same masses because the density function is symmetric about the z-axis. So this is important. The density is symmetric as well as the region. Okay. And if you actually wrote down the integrals for finding the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, you would compute them. <coughs> now, all right, so I'm, I'm interested in what z-bar is, the average value of the z-coordinate in the region. So in other words, I'm not going to integrate all of the vector x at this point. The vector x would have x, y, z, and I'm only going to do the z-coordinate, which means I'm only going to do with the integral of a scalar function rather than doing three scalar function integrals. So I'm going to do the integral over the region of density, which depends on where I am, times the z coordinate over the total mass. OK, 
Okay, so let's, let's <coughs> warm up. What's the total mass? So, so what coordinate system do I want to use? Spherical. Spherical, of course. And the density function is some constant proportionality times what in spherical coordinates? What's the rho? The density <coughs> is rho times a constant. And then my formula for dv in spherical coordinates? Rho squared sine phi. Rho squared sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Theta goes from? 0 to 3 pi. Phi goes? 0 to pi over 2. Rho goes? 0 to r. We never specified the radius, did we? So we'll. I'll call it A just to be concrete. Okay, so that if I do that integral, of course, it's going to depend on the constant of proportionality, but that's going to cancel out in the net answer, right? I probably can. So I'm going to have K, and in the interest of time here, since I have stuff I want to do today, I'm going to do the rest of it quickly here. Integral of rho cubed, rho to the fourth over four, so I'm going to get A to the fourth over four. Integral of sine phi from 0 to pi over 2. It's going to be 1. And then there's going to be a 2 pi. So I'm going to have pi over 2, k, a to the fourth is the mass. And now I integrate z times the density. So I'm going to have the integral, same limits, k again, which as Cameron points out, pulls out. I need the density in there, so it's k rho, and I need z. z in spherical coordinates? Uh, rho cosine phi. Rho cosine phi. And then I put my fudge factor, rho squared sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. So now we have an integral of rho to the fourth, <coughs> right? Rho to the fourth, so I've got e to the five over five. I have the integral of sine phi cosine phi. So that's one half. One half sine squared phi mm -hmm. from zero to pi over two is just going to be one half, and then I still have my two pi. So I have pi over five k e to the fifth. Wait, where, where, did, where did sine squared come from? You told me it. Cosine, cosine phi, phi, sine phi. And integrating sine phi, cosine phi. Okay, yeah. And we could do cosine phi squared, but okay. we have to do that. <coughs> then you're up by, you have a minus yeah. sign, can give you the same answer. All right? So, so z bar is k times pi over 5 a to the fifth over k times pi over 2, a to the fourth, and not surprisingly, the case cancel, which makes sense, and it's linear in A, which also makes sense. No, well, actually, it's not clear that it makes sense. <laughs> but, it is, but it is, in fact, in A. Well, because of the varying density, it might not be clear that if you scale it, that the mass and the I guess do you need the density moment. to be going up that much to account for the increase in volume or something? Yeah. As you go out radial. Right. But, but if we certainly if the density were constant, you would expect the z quarter to be uh, yeah. linear in A. I guess if it was, the density was greater towards the outside of the sphere, it would the z would be higher. It was, it was more well, well, yeah, but like if the proportion was great, you know, if it was like but there's ten more sphere lower. What are you saying? No, I don't know that. Well, okay. It's, it's like the outside of the sphere is only two. I don't. I actually inside. can't give an intuitive proof that it had to be linear to start with, given the density function. Okay. So you'll have some of these to set up on web work next week.
Now, one of my favorite topics when I studied physics many moons ago was to understand not just how systems of particles behave when you push on them and then they translate somehow, but what happens if you start making the thing spin. And so you have rotational energy as well as translational kinetic energy. So I want to talk a little bit about where moments of inertia come from. And then we're going to use this, this is also done in the book, to, to answer the following question, which I think is sort of cute. So, cute question. So, for, it's not exactly super applicable, but it's still sort of cute. Imagine that you have a rather sizable inclined plane. And at the top of this sloping inclined plane, you, you put a bunch of different shaped objects. And we're going to try to ask the question, who wins the race down to the bottom? So I'm not going to try to draw all these things because I'm not good enough an artist. But you might have a monstrous hula hoop. So you have a hula hoop. You might have a solid filled in ball. You might have a <coughs> hollow ball. You might have a, I'm running out of room on my inclined plane. You might have a solid cylinder. Tomato soup. A hollow cylinder, maybe? A hula hoop is essentially a hollow cylinder. What else might you have that you might want to roll down this? <laughs> Double good. Uh, a what? It's a solid base. You might have your favorite teacher you yeah. would like to <laughs> roll down the hill and see what happens. <laughs> Double good. Good. Double cone. So I'm running out of room here, but you could have a cone shape like that. It was you do it opposite too, with the fat size to that. Well, you gotta have wheels for it to roll on though. Yeah, well, well one wheel. wheel. Yeah. So or, play or, unicycle. You know, <laughs> well, so so ultimately I'm gonna ask you who wins the race, and we're gonna figure this out. It's all about who. Yeah. Michael is banned from the bidding. Can I, can I actually bet money to somebody on it? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to ask you guys to think about over the weekend is design the shape that is going to beat all of these. So design the optimal shape. So the question is, that for you to ponder is, what is the optimal shape? If you have ideas, I don't want you flirting them out right now because I want people to think about it. So, what about the geometry and the physics of these shapes is going to tell and is going to answer the physics question? Do they all have constant density? They do not. <coughs> oh. Uh, well, okay. I guess I'm going to assume they're all symmetric. However, do you think the do you think the time that the shape takes to get to the bottom depends on its size or its mass? Uh, so, are we assuming they're all the same mass? Well, I just asked that question. Does the act, so if I took a ball that was one foot radius and weighed a pound, or a ball that was 12 feet radius and weighed 100 pounds, they're actually going to get to the bottom at the same time. Yuming is correct. So there is a question about, does it depend on the mass, does it depend on the density, or does it just depend on the shape? And so, for reasons that I now want to explain, moment of inertia is the thing you actually have to understand here. Do you need to take into account surface area and frictional coefficients? So, as always, 
with physics problems, we're going to ignore friction, except it wouldn't roll if you didn't have friction. So there's enough. So this is always this. This is 22. This bothered me when I took physics, and your professor told me to shut up. Um, basically, you want to ignore friction. In other words, we're going to use conservation of energy here in the end, but a small amount. Well, you can just say each contacts the surface is an area of zero to have rolling. So there's no friction. Well, but you need some friction because if, if they don't roll yeah. and they just slide, then it's a different question. Aren't there two different kinds of friction? Isn't like rotational friction? Like, no, there's sliding kind of friction sliding. and there's, there's static, static friction. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't well, if you, though, had like twisted it before you set it there, it just keep going? You had it like. Yeah, so you're asking you if, I, if I gave them all a head start, could, start with a yeah. certain speed? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, you gave them all a head start. There's no friction. 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 But in real life, if you actually do experiments, the experiments will verify what we're actually going to compute empirically here. Are we on the moon or the earth here? <laughs> Could you make it? it doesn't matter. Does it really not matter? It does not matter. Could you make it almost like a, where you have like a, a mass inside it, like sand, that will roll towards like always be the bottom part? <coughs> so, kind of momentum. so you can design more complicated shapes and do more complicated physics here than I'm willing to do today. If you start having inhomogeneous creatures, if this solid ball were like the Earth where it had a heavy core at the middle and then less density going out, you would get a different answer. And you can try to do that problem, but I'm not, I, I, I have only finitely much time, so I'm gonna just do simple questions here, but you can make the problem harder. So what is moment of inertia and why does it show up? Resistance rotational change. So, like the moment they start? No, it, it's a weird use of the word moment. Well, it's moment in the sense of this thing actually being what's called a integrating x. That will be called in statistics or in physics a first moment hmm. about the, the origin. And then there's second moments where you do things having to do with squares of distances, and third moments <coughs> with third power. So it's in that sense, it is uh, it is consistent with the language. All right. So, we're to propose this. so imagine now still a, ri a rigid body. So that's the word the physicists use. I'm still going to have a discrete configuration of point masses. So I'm going to do the finite case and then I'm going to do as I did before and just say mumble mumble by an integral. <coughs> so here's the situation now. Rigid body is going to mean that the masses are invisibly and unmassively hooked to one another so that their relative configurations don't change. So you have, as I was drawing before, you have, say, a mass at one position, another mass at another position, another mass at another position, etc. But they're all linked by massless rods so that that configuration can't change. That's what rigid body means. And what I want to imagine now is taking that, and you might have 25 million of these, I'm just not going to draw them all. I want to take an axis and I want to spin this rigid body with angular velocity, constant angular velocity omega, around a given axis. Doesn't have to go through the center of mass of the configuration, just any rigid line that I want this thing spinning around. So you could imagine taking the axis and joining it by massless bars to the masses and spinning the axis around at angular velocity omega and the masses would rotate around. 
Does it have to go through the mass or can we have it outside the mass? No. It'll be anywhere you want. One of your challenge problems for the week, if you want to do it, actually is going to ask how the thing we're about to compute changes if you move it parallel to some other place. Amazingly, that's called the parallel axis theorem. Amazing. Okay. So, what, I'm, what I want to try to figure out here is what is the energy of this rotating system? So. So we will talk more about energy when we get to chapter 8. I know you can't wait. And the relation between energy and work and such things. But what I'm assuming that you know from what little high school physics you've had, or college physics, is that if you have a mass moving with velocity vector v, its kinetic energy is 1 half mass times magnitude of v squared, in other words, speed squared. So this is. Where this comes from, I will give you a little bit more hints later on, but take a physics course. <laughs> so, if these guys are rotating around that axis with <coughs> speed omega, what speeds are they moving with? I want to add them up for the total kinetic energy of the system. So I want to take total kinetic energy of the rotating system And that's going to be the sum over these finite number of masses of one half ith mass magnitude of ith velocity vector squared. So you say to yourself, uh -oh. as this system turns, what are these masses actually doing? They're going in circles. They're moving in circles that are planes <coughs> perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And what are the radii of those circles? Their distance from the axis. It's the distance from the axle, or axis, right. So for each mass, I'm going to say <coughs> that there is a distance to the axis. And I'm going to write that distance to the axis as r. So this would be r1, this would be r2, this would be r3, and those distances are constant, they're not changing. So what is, the, what is the velocity vector, if you're going around a circle at constant angular speed, what is your velocity vector? Omega r. Pi r velocity pi vector. It's always... The, it's always towards the center, isn't it? No, you think it's acceleration. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. Tangent to the yeah. circle. And it's got what magnitude? R, R weird W. R omega is the magnitude, right? Remember we said arc length on a circle is radius times angle. The rate at which the angle is changing is omega. The rate at which that arc length is changing is radius times angular speed. So this is going to be sum 1 half ith mass ith distance from the axis times angular speed squared. And it doesn't take a wizard to rewrite this as the following. One half mi ri squared summed times omega squared. So the half and the omega squared are constants that pull out of the sum. Is there a reason you didn't put the omega in the front with the one half? I was just following what I had here. <laughs> and this the physicists have decreed is going to be called capital I, which is going to be the moment of inertia. And you're going to have one half I omega squared. So the analogy is with this formula, where you have a one half mass speed squared, you have one half thingamabob times angular speed squared. So this is an interesting object that builds in both the mass and the geometry of the system relative to the fixed line. It's like a weighted, weighted. It's a weighted second moment where you're, you're doing the sum of the squares of the distance from the axis. So the squaring is second moment, 
and you're waiting by the lenses. So, what we're interested in doing is computing these things for co more complicated things. Well, here I'm not going to take the time to go through chopping up my region into tiny little pieces and saying, take the limit. What is this going to turn into? The moment of inertia is going to turn into an integral where you do distance squared from the axis times mass. Well, the mass is density times a little piece of volume. So you're going to integrate density times distance squared dv over omega, where r is the distance <coughs> from the axis. Why am I calling it r? Because we're going to think cylindrical coordinates with this being the z-axis. And it's going to be really r. So that's convenient for us, right? All right, so what we will do on Monday is actually compute these but I want to actually set up the physics so you see how the, I'm not done yet, how, I'm going to set up the physics to see how solving this question is going to be given by capital I. So, the, the solution to the problem is going to be the following. When the problem, when the, when the race starts, they're all sitting at the top, ready to roll. <laughs> They're not rolling yet. So they've got a certain amount of what is called potential energy relative to the ground. So if you're at the top of the hill and the hill has height h, a mass m will have potential energy, which again I will talk about when we get to chapter 8. The potential energy will be, when, when h is small relative to the radius of the Earth, this is not valid for big h's. It's only valid for small h's. So that inclined plane does not go half of the moon. <coughs> it can go up 100 feet, it can go up a mile, but so it's not going... So it doesn't work on the moon. You have to have no, a constant... put the experiment on the moon. If we made the inclined plane, the moon has to work. This would not work. <laughs> it would better be putting the sun. It has to do with like the gravitational. Yes. So it's potential. Yeah. It, what, it, what this is, as you will see in chapter 8, is the work required to lift the mass to this height. That gives you that much potential energy. And there is no kinetic at, at the beginning. All right? So I'm doing potential relative to the ground level. On the other hand, at the end, I've got potential which is zero because I'm at ground level. Are we worrying about like a slight variation in H for smaller ones? Like no, I'm not. not. I'm, not. <coughs> I'm going to start with the center of mass of the object aligned with the edge of the... And at the end I've got it all as kinetic energy because they're all moving and they're at ground height. So what kinetic energy do they have? Well, they have the speed and rotation. That's right. So there's two pieces. There's this rotational kinetic energy that we just talked about. So this is due to the rotation of the object about the axis of symmetry. So if it's a rolling ball, it's, as it rolls, it's, it's turning around the axis through the center of mass. And then it's also got translational kinetic energy because when it gets to the bottom, it's actually moving at some speed going laterally. So you've got one half m speed squared. Now, how do you just say the speed and the omega are related? Well, the omega changes, by the way. Right? And it's at the top, it's not rotating. As it goes down the hill, it turns faster and faster and faster. So at the bottom, it's got some rotational speed and it's got some translational speed. And they are related, as we said, by the formula. Where did I put it? That the translational speed is the radius times the angular speed. So let's say that our object has radius A. I know I need to finish quickly here. Yeah. 
So then I'm going to have one half i, and, and this is going to be magnitude of v over a squared plus one half m magnitude of v squared. So what I want to do is factor out a one half. And I want to put an m v squared out here. So I've got a one half m v squared there. And what have I got here? I've got an i. I've divided by a squared. And I had an m here that wasn't here, so I have to divide i by m a squared. And what do you see? So this is what I'm going to end with, and we'll pick up with this on Monday. You're going to see that for a given potential energy, first of all, the m's cancel. To get the greatest speed, which will get you downhill, you have to convince yourself that the guy that's going the fastest at the bottom was going faster all along, and therefore gets there fastest. So you have to think through that for a second. But you want v squared biggest. For, for a given quantity here, the mass is canceled. So you want this to be what if you want the fastest one? Smallest. Well, one can't get any smaller. So this has to be as small as possible to win the race. And that's what we're going to do on Monday.